You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. Well, hello everyone. Good to be together again. If I haven't met you before, my name is Garth. I'm one of the leaders in our Ronnebosch congregation. And uh, if you're joining us for the first time, it is great to have you with us. We've been going through the book of Exodus as a community, and boy, has it been an adventure so far. And although the, the story only takes place um, over a couple of years, um, it feels like a roller coaster ride. It feels like there's so much excitement in this one book. And it's no wonder that Disney decided to make a movie about it. It's such a rich book. And there's so much that we see about God and his character and his people and, uh, and the Christian story, the, the very narrative of the Christian story. And uh, just to summarize what we've been through at the beginning, we saw the Israelites are slaves to the Egyptian people. And the story begins with Moses. He's this Hebrew boy that's adopted as an Egyptian prince. And uh, when he gets older, he would murder an Egyptian for treating a Hebrew uh, badly. And uh, he feels condemned. And so he runs out to the wilderness to this place called Midian, where he, he settles down and he marries for 40 years years go by and then God hears the cries of his people that are enslaved in Egypt and uh, he speaks to Moses through this burning bush and he calls him to be this mediator, this representative to help free God's people from slavery and, uh, and he's super hesitant. <laughs> he's thinking you got the wrong guy and, and God is gracious with him and uh, even though he, he doesn't speak eloquently, he gets his brother Aaron to come along Alongside him, and uh, and God sends Aaron and Moses to Pharaoh to to go and uh, and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. He says, "Let my people go." Anyone who's watched the Prince of Egypt, you now have that song in your head. Let my people go for the rest of the day. It's a pleasure. 
And then we see that God uses these 10 plagues. He brings about judgment on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And we, we learn in our message about two weeks ago that, that the God that we serve is a righteous God who judges evil justly and who is a God of justice. And we can take heart in this, that God doesn't wink at sin and that we know that God will have the final say. And uh, through these plagues, we see Pharaoh's heart, actually it's hardened even more and he just won't let the Israelites go. And then last week we saw the final plague being the death of the firstborn sons of Egypt. And we, we heard this amazing message last week on how God makes a way for the Israelites firstborn to be spared by the blood of the spotless lamb would be the, the substitute and the pardon from uh, God's wrath and death. And uh, this was obviously called Passover. And in the same way for Christ followers, we know that Jesus is the substitute offered for us. He takes our sin, he has conquered death that we could have eternal life with him. And uh, also last week in the middle of Chapter 12, we see God, uh, God says, remember this. He, he institutes Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread. And uh, he does this basically to say, he says, I know your human condition. I know it's not going to be long before you forget what happened. So do this to remember my faithfulness. Do this to remember what I have done. And last week we got to do a communion and maybe you potentially even did communion in your life groups together. But in communion in a, in a similar way is something Jesus asks us to do in remembrance of his loving faithfulness and his work on the cross where he became our substitute. And the, and the Christian story is basically one of how human sinfulness separates us from God. And in his mercy, in his grace, he rescues his people. He reconciles them to himself. To himself. And Exodus is basically the short story narrative of this. And today we're looking from halfway through chapter 12 to chapter, the end of chapter 14. And we're going to zoom in on how God rescues his people, the Israelites. And today um, we can see that one thing from these chapters or the one main idea that we're going to say, the, w- the one thing that I want us to appreciate today is that our God is mighty to save. Our God is mighty to save. And so I'm going to share the story as we see in the chapters. And as I unpack the journey, I'm going to focus on a few verses along the way. But why don't you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that we can gather together today. Thank you that we can be together, sit under your word, that we can hear from you. I pray that you would presence yourself with us today. Pray that you would speak to us, that you would reveal more of who you are to us, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that is mighty to save, Lord. Thank you that we might experience your grace. I pray that you would come and reveal more of who you are. Come and do that, Jesus. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. So in chapter 12, we see it's time. It's Time And as we know, exodus means exit. And well, this is the time of the exit. Of the exit. And freedom is soon upon the Israelites. And uh, the, the Egyptians are done with the Israelites. They, they are done. And Pharaoh has given the order to the Israelites to be free. In fact, the, the Egyptians are even pleading, please go. We don't want any more plagues. We don't want any more of this. And, uh, and God actually gives them favor uh, and the Israelites favor. And he says that they can take jewelry and gold and resources from the Egyptians. And so we see that there's not only freedom, but there's kind of this blessing as they get to plunder from the Egyptians. And what's even more interesting is, is that as, they, as they're leaving, in verse 37 and 38, it says this. It says, The people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children, and a mixed multitude also went up with them. And, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And it's amazing to see that a mixed multitude of people would go with them. So it's not just the Israelites, but there's other Egyptians, other people that were not Israelites that would go with them. And this is a powerful statement because obviously these events, these plagues had revealed 
that God is the one true living God. It's Yahweh that is doing this. And this leads to other people wanting to be part of this freedom that lies ahead, wanting to follow Yahweh, the one true living God. And uh, it's just emphasized that it's not that the people of Israel were, were special in themselves, but that actually God is who he says he is. The Israelites are not unique, powerful people. They're a chosen people, chosen by Yahweh. And what we see next is God leads the people around the wilderness to the Red Sea. He basically takes them the long way around, but he's, he's, he's gracious in this. That he, he knows that if they had to go past the, the Philistines or the shooter, uh, shorter route, the Israelites would see war. And before you know it, they're going to want to run back to Egypt. And so it's fascinating to see how God chooses to lead them. We see in, in chapter 13, verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. And there's this, this beautiful scene that we see here is that God presents, presents himself with the Israelites by day and by night. He does two things here. He, he would guide them and he would also, we'd see later that he would protect them. He would protect them. I think even today, if you call yourself a Christ follower, we have the very presence of God available to us. There's this beautiful promise that God makes that he will never leave us, never forsake us. And his, his guidance, his direction is made available to us. And we don't need a, a pillars of cloud. We don't need pillars of fire, but we have his word. We have his Holy Spirit. And uh, the scripture says that his word is a lamp unto my feet. And, uh, and God would speak to us through his word. He guides us with his truth. And also his very presence is available to us in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is our guide. The Holy Spirit is our security. Ephesians tells us that the Holy Spirit is this down payment, this deposit for eternity to come with Jesus. There's a security in this. And I think of the Holy Spirit being a guide. Before Jesus goes into the wilderness, he'd say that the, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. In Acts, we see the apostles often say they were led to, uh, by the Spirit to go to a place or not to go to a place. Or they had to make a decision that seemed good to them and the Holy Spirit. And uh, if we think of a current GPS system on our phones, I mean, it makes it so easy for us to get to a place. I mean, not so long ago, you'd have a MacBook, you'd have to take it out, you'd have to work out how you got there. It was a little bit of a adventure to almost try find the place. You felt like you had won a game by the time that you had, had got there. But nowadays we get to just put in a location and I can fully trust that the GPS is going to get me there. I don't double check the route and all of that. I just know that if I put it in and I press start, whatever road block, road block or traffic might come, I know that the destination is inevitable and it is correct and I'm going to get there. And as Christ follows, how much more should we trust the Lord in his guidance of our lives? And a question for us would be, is Jesus the ultimate guide to our lives? Are we guided by him? He not only knows the way, man, he is the way. He is the way. And if I'm honest, I think the reason we can just press start on that GPS system is because, man, we trust that GPS system completely. And in the same way, I think sometimes that's not how we trust uh, God's plan in our lives. And as Christ follows, we need to trust God. We need to trust that he has the big picture, that he promises to never leave us or forsake us, that he'll get us to where we're going within his timing, within his planning. And you know, it can feel uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes following God doesn't make sense to us. It, it almost feels like we're going the wrong way in, in some ways. And uh, God gave me this illustration uh, a couple of years ago where he was calling me uh, to, to trust him. But it was almost like um, the, the illustration or picture that came to mind was, it was just as if God had told me to uh, um, go to Joburg and um, got in my car and I started driving and I thought, I've got to drive along the N1. That is the quickest route to Johannesburg. And so I get onto the N1 and I start driving and it's like God says to me, no, what I want you to do is actually go 
along the N2. And I'm going, Lord, there are kind of two main highways in South Africa. The one is the N1, the one is the N2. If I drive along the N1, I get to Johannesburg. If I drive along the N2, I'll probably end up in Durban. Or I'm going to go a really long way around here. And, and God's saying, no, I want you to go along the N2. And so you drive around and all the while you're driving, getting back onto the N2, you're thinking, I'm pretty sure this is not the right way or this is going to take too long or this isn't the way I should be going. And it's not 10 minutes before you're driving along the N2 that God says, now I want you to take a left. And what's on the left? No, this is the airport. I want you to drive in and I want you to get onto a plane and I want you to fly to Johannesburg. Now, what I'm not saying in this picture is that if you follow God, he has the most comfortable route and the quickest route. And no, that's not what I'm saying. The point of the story is that sometimes following God doesn't make sense, but it requires a faith in him, him who has the bigger picture. It's the faith and the trust in him who has that picture. You see, God's wisdom, God's way, His very presence is not made for this world. It's of a, another kingdom. But we trust His guidance and His way because of who He is, because of who He says He is. And so when God says wait, we can wait patiently, trusting Him. When He says don't go, we cannot go, knowing that it's for our good. We He says follow me, we can say, we can follow Him wholeheartedly. We can go all in because of who he is. And, and maybe you watching today and you, you haven't put your faith in Christ. You may be still just checking things out. And maybe there's a lot that, that doesn't make sense to you right now. And uh, maybe there's something in you that, that knows that Jesus is the way, knows that this is true about him. But possibly everything in your life might be say, oh, that's a bad idea or I don't even know how this would work out if I followed him or my friends and family won't understand. Or maybe even I know that if I follow him, my life it's actually going to change radically and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for that. And I'd say trust in him who has the bigger picture. Trust in him who can presence himself with you. Trust in him who can be your guide. He will not leave you and he will not forsake you. And it might be uncomfortable. It might be uncomfortable, but he'll be with you every step of the way. He is the ultimate God. And for those of us, I think, that, that call ourselves Christ followers, um, I heard someone share their testimony on Monday and they said, I had to make a decision and everything looked good on paper, but they didn't have the peace of God in this decision. They knew that it wasn't the right opportunity for them. And I'd ask us, are there things in our lives that seem good on paper, good to us, good to maybe even everyone around us, but they're either not, not the way of Jesus or it might not be what God is leading us into. Can I encourage us to trust God as our ultimate God, as our ultimate guide? Trust God. And so on with our, our journey next, we see God telling Moses to get the Israelites to, to camp uh, next to the Red Sea. And he tells uh, Moses that this is what's going to happen. He's going to harden uh, Pharaoh's heart and the Egyptians' heart. They're going to come after them. Uh, but God says, don't worry, I will deal with them and uh, I'll get the glory over Pharaoh and his arm, army. And so we see again, God is passionate about his glory. He wants them to know that he's the one true living God, that he is Yahweh. And so Moses leads the people towards the Red Sea where they camp out and uh, they would now be kind of closed between the wilderness and the Red Sea. And, and, and what begins to happen, uh, uh, what begins to happen is exactly what God says. Pharaoh and the Egyptians have a bit of this divine amnesia and they realize that they've lost their whole working force and, and God hardens uh, his heart once again and uh, Pharaoh and his army start to chase after the Israelites and uh, Pharaoh just can't let them go. And, and we read this from, from verse 10. It says, when Pharaoh drew, drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die 
in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you, whom you see today shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I'll harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I'll get the glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I've gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And so we see the the people of God have this promise of deliverance and all of a sudden things are not making sense. They're stuck in a, in a cul-de-sac and they have the armies of Pharaoh after them and they, they fear greatly. And in this fear, they lose trust in God. They lose trust in his promises to deliver them. And uh, in their fear, they can, they can pretty much conclude one thing that this must be a trap, that Moses must have brought them out there to die. And uh, he actually said, they actually said to Moses, is this why you brought us out here? Is there not enough graves in Egypt? They say bondage actually would have been better than dying in the wilderness. And when we look at the story of the crossing of the Red Sea, we see this one event as this, the final act of God's delivering his people from slavery in Egypt. This one, and, and this is one of the single greatest acts of salvation in the Old Testament. And it's continually recalled throughout Scripture to represent God's saving power. God tells them to remember this as well. He brings it up. Remember my saving power. And so what we can look at is, uh, what we're going to look at now is, is what are they saved from? How are they saved? And how does this actually apply to us? And uh, what they've been saved from is bondage in Egypt. Bondage in Egypt. For us in Christ followers, this represents uh, a sin for us. And what God did through Moses was to provide this physical salvation from a physical slavery. But we see this in correlation for us in what God does through Christ in providing a spiritual salvation from spiritual slavery. And like the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, spiritually, we all slaves to sin. And it's like Jesus said to, to the Pharisees, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is enslaved to sin. So if the sun sets you free, well, then you'll be free indeed. And it's not long after the Egyptians have uh, been set free from this bondage in Egypt that they lose trust in God. They're wanting to go back to slavery. They've just been set free. They're looking back to bondage saying this probably would have been better circumstances or a better solution than the newfound freedom. And you see, objectively, they're free from slavery, but subjectively, they're still sla uh, slaves. And although we might be afforded freedom in Christ, we too can find ourselves going back to the very things that we were once enslaved to. You see, for those who believe in Jesus, the truth is that we've been positionally set free from the penalty of sin, but we can still struggle with the bondage of sin this side of heaven until one day we'll be in heaven with, with Jesus and there'll be no sin. In Romans 6, it says, for, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. And Tim Keller, a famous preacher and theologian, speaking about this, he sets out these three ways that we can struggle the side of heaven where we live like slaves, although we've been spiritually set free. And, and, and the first thing he says is we can fall back into the, the slavishness of sin. And, and the truth is, we can still struggle with wanting to go back to the old life of bondage and, and fall into sinful practices again. And we often think, I often think that this is because we actually don't really believe that we've been set free or that following Jesus will lead to true freedom in our lives. We don't actually believe that we've been set free in, in Christ and that we don't actually believe that freedom would come from obedience rooted in faith. And so there can also be 
us not believing that God actually has the power to change us, that God actually has the power to change us, believing in his saving power. And some of us often will find ourselves fighting for freedom that we already have in Christ. Uh, when I was in standard eight, I had this math teacher and uh, I wasn't very good at math. I was in standard grade class and uh, we had this math teacher um, at, and uh, we all arrived and it was the first day of the term. And, uh, as, a, and a stat, as a standard grade class, I can tell you there wasn't a lot of hope in us to get great marks. But what this teacher did was quite fascinating. When we sat down on this first day of term, he took out his book. He had all our names there. And what he said to us is that, I want to let you all know that I've given you all an A for this term. I've given you all an A from this term. And he wrote the A in his book and he said he'd show us and he showed us. And so he showed us where our name is and showed us where the A was next to the name. And what he said to us was, now that the A is there, these are the tests we're going to write. These are the exams we're going to write. All you need to do is keep the A. All you need to do is keep the A and hold on to it. Work hard, work diligently and keep it. And what happened was, some of us did get A's and a lot of us did a lot better than we'd ever done before. And what was the change? The change was that when we approached exams, when we approached tests, we approached exams and tests as A students trying to do our best in the marks that we got. Instead of being standard grade math students struggling to try and strive an A that we thought we had never, ever achieve. And we need to believe that we've been set free, that God has the power to change us, that all we can bring to the table is obedience rooted in faith. And what happens in this freedom is we end up becoming more of who we already are in Christ, of who we already are in Christ. Another thing Tim Keller says, he says we can go the other way. We can uh, depend on our works, righteousness, where we think that we have what it takes to set ourselves free. This would be like the Egyptians saying that, man, if we really work hard and diligently in Egypt, then well, God will set us free because of who we are and what we've done and what we've achieved. And I think we can often struggle with this because we don't, also, we don't believe that someone else could do this on our behalf. We don't, we don't truly believe in this free gift of grace. And the world tells us that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And it also means that we, we can't take control of our salvation, which means that we don't get the glory. And one of the most freeing aspects of following Jesus is actually that we would be weaned of self-glorification, that this can actually be one of the biggest blessings to us. The other thing that uh, Tim Keller says is that we still deal with temptation of idolatry in our hearts. Our, our hearts are continu to continually wanting to make creation ultimate over the creator. It's like a default position. It's where good things become ultimate things, which become sinful things in our hearts. And it's this default setting that needs this recalibration of God's truth that position our hearts in their rightful place before God so that we can worship the creator but within creation in its rightful place in our hearts. The other question is, well, how did God save them? And uh, we see that, well, it's by God's grace alone. Even though the Israelites are fearful and mistrusting, we see God is still mighty to save. And in verse 13 and 14, we see Moses tell the Israelites, he says, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which uh, he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. What we see here is that salvation is not about what we do. It's rather about what God has done for us in Jesus. We cannot deliver ourselves out of slavery. The only way to get out of slavery is by God's grace alone. Goth cannot save Goth. I need Jesus. You see, because of the Israelites' 
mistrust and them thinking within the physical realm, them thinking that really that they only have two options. Either they, they fight and die at the hands of Pharaoh, or they go back to slavery and they try and make that work. That's the only options that they can see. But there's actually, there's actually another way that doesn't have anything to do with them, but has everything to do with God. And that's to trust in God that he would make a way where there is no way and that he would fight on their behalf. They just need to, they just need to stand firm. They need to stand firm and trust God. And that's what God does. We see him, he moves the cloud to the back of the Israelites to stop Pharaoh and his army. That's where the protection comes in. He tells Moses, lift up your staff. He does that. And, and, the, and the waters of the Red Sea start to, to part and the Israelites walk through with these big walls of water on the right and on the left of them. And it's easy for us to, to look at this and think, well, they would have just been relieved and confident walking through the sea. But the reality is probably most of them were, were terrified. They're still managing this fear as they're trying to step out in faith. And you can't blame them. You've got two massive walls of water on, on either side of you. But you see, what we see from this is that it's not the quality of their faith that allows them to be rescued, but rather the object of the faith that rescues them, which is God our God who is mighty to save. What we see next is God calls Moses to, to lift up his staff and to close the sea as Pharaoh and his army charge forward. He closes the sea on them. You see the, the, the sea in this moment is a symbol of God's final wrath and judgment. And we see God bringing judgment on the Egyptians through the plagues as we've seen in the previous chapters. But commentators would almost call this the the, the 11th plague, the 11th and final plague. And uh, it represents the wrath and death of God's judgment for unrepentant, hardened hearts. And uh, Israel would be able to go through these waters. And instead of the, God's wrath and death, they would get favor, they would get freedom, they'd get new life on the other side of the sea. And where there seemed to be no way God would make a way with his undeserved grace, with his redemptive power. And I mean, God could have sent them down the same path with all their whinging, their whining, their unbelief. But God is gracious. He is faithful to his promises. He cannot deny himself. But also what we see is that Israel had a mediator appointed by God in Moses. And, and Moses was, he was the man in the middle. He was the man in the middle. And he was the man that could identify with uh, the Israelites, but he could also be their representative before God because he was appointed by God. He had that relationship with God. We see in the, in the rest of Exodus, I mean, he has his work cut out from him. He, he uh, has to do his best to reconcile this relationship between God and his people. But, but just as, Israelite, as the Israelites would have Moses, as Christ follows, we have even a better mediator in Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ, Jesus. You see, Jesus, through his finished work on the cross, he's made a way for us to be reconciled with God once and for all. And uh, we, we read in the, the last two verses in chapter 14, it reads as follows, it says, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. You see, our God is mighty to save. He triumphs over evil, sin, and death. He sets the captives free. The Israelites go from fearing death and the Egyptians to fearing the Lord, to believing in the Lord. And um, what happens is as the Israelites make their way through the Red Sea, they burst into songs of praise. They're overwhelmed at this miracle that God's just done. They're overwhelmed at the mighty saving work of God. And, uh, and next week, Paul's going to be with us. He's going to unpack that song a little bit more. But as Christ follows, we too get to celebrate the loving, gracious God that we serve, who is 
mighty to save. It's by his grace alone that we are saved. This means that we, we can't earn it because it's God's free gift to us. It also means that there is not bondage or sin that Jesus has not overcome or dealt with on our behalf. He's fought for us and he has won the battle for us. All we need to do is believe it. All we need to do is believe it. We don't need to fear anything else. We get to fear the Lord. We get to believe in Jesus and his finished work. We get to walk with him. He will presence himself with us and he is our ultimate guide. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for speaking to us today. I thank you that um, we don't need to look to our selves as for redemption, but that we can look to your finished work on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you are our great substitute and that um, it's only by your grace. There is nothing that we could add. There is nothing that we could do. And I pray that this truth would bring a freshness to our souls, a, a celebration to our souls as Christ followers, and an invitation to any of us that are still maybe exploring the claims of who you are, Lord. Lord, we, we celebrate you and we praise your, your mighty saving hand, Lord. Thank you for making a way where there was no way. Pray this in your mighty name. Amen.